characters on Dota 2 and lots of other characters on lots of other video games. And I forget, who are you now? <laughs> Sean Connery thing you did. You know that Welsh accent? 
And of course, I didn't have the heart to tell him that Sean Connery is Scottish, but you know, we, <laughs> we were going on in the game, and we got to this place where I was supposed to say goodbye some. And I said, well, I mean, why am I saying goodbye to him? What's going on? I have no idea. And they didn't either, so I had to call the writer, and I'm sitting there in the booth, and they're in the control room, talking to him. This was before cell phones, they had to like, you know, dial and all this kind of stuff. And uh, they finally got back to me and said, okay, what's happening here is, this is where the game forks. Your son is either going to go down the street and get some bread and be right back, or he's going to go through this interdimensional time warp and go into another universe and you're never going to see him again. <laughs> so did you say it so it would work either way? <laughs> and so I said, goodbye, son. And they said, great, that's great, that'll work, fine. So, but the learning curve was really sharp. I mean, by the time I was doing No One Lives Forever, and, uh, and, and the suffering and stuff like that, the writers were always at the studio with you and, and, they're, and they're just great. I mean, every writer of a game that I've ever met has been an insane maniac mutant freak. And for, for all our Valve work, yeah. the writers, always there, always. Yeah, yeah. And, and they learned that you know, if you're an actor, you need to know why you're saying what you're saying. Um, for instance, if I wrote W-H-A-T question mark, up here, where you could read it, how would you read that? What? 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 And all of those are right, <laughs> depending on the situation, right? So, you know, an actor can't, you just can't write something and say, okay, say this, and, and think that it's gonna come out right. And so this is one of the main reasons that acting has gotten so much better in games over the last 20 years, is because they know how to direct actors, finally. But, so I was going along, happy as a clam, but then I saw, Wait a minute, Ellen wants me to make more money for her. I want her to make more money for me. <laughs> so I started beating her up to get her own voice demo. And this started about 1991 or so. The, the, the real abuse started then. And, uh, <laughs> and by about 2002, is that right, 2001? In May of 2002, I got a voice demo because, of course, what I said to John was, no, you know, I won't get any work, and women's voices, you know, they always use men, and no, I can't do this. Right kind of voice. Right. Like. And so then I got a voice demo and I immediately got work. <laughs> and just so you know, the very first job that she got, how many of you fly on our commercial airlines. Show of hands. Do you know who's in control? <laughs> the very first job Ellen got was as the voice of the Honeywell Runway Approach System voice. The voice that pilots on airlines all over the world call Bitchin' Betty. <laughs> Thank you. Just go, damn you, GLaDOS! <laughs> no, but that was that was one of the first gigs I did, and and it was great fun. Yeah. You know, I, I recorded it in uh, Seattle, right. and I say things like, climb, climb now, <laughs> descend, descend now. <laughs> and she had to say all these things in three different ways, like yeah, and the the copy, you know, the 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 paper with the words on it that I was supposed to say was printed in three colors. Green, which was, you know, just very sort of work a day. Yellow, which was heightened. And red, which was get your stuff together right now. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. So that was fun. And meanwhile, I was doing things like uh, uh, The Matrix Online, stuff like that. And then I got an audition for a game called Half-Life 2. <laughs> and they hired me to play uh, all of the citizens. And it was interesting because, you know, I went in there and, and so, so do you want me to do a different voice for each citizen? I said, no, that really won't work because there's so many of them. We just, you know, we just want you to do your voice, just your voice, just read all the lines. And so if you play through Half-Life 2, you'll notice citizens talking to each other. That's just me talking to me in my voice. <laughs> And, and they, they liked my work, and so they decided to hire me to do Odessa Cubbage, too, 
which is the guy who, who teaches you how to use the rocket launcher to shoot down the, the alien helicopter. But, uh, and then, um, then they sent an audition out for a part called the Overwatch, and they were looking for a woman for that, and so Ellen auditioned for that. Yeah, and uh, they, they said part of the direction was, you know, they wanted, they wanted sort of British slash Scottish slash, you know, I don't know. And I have to tell you all that I, I really didn't know what the recording was for. Right, right. It, uh, game, what game, you know, I don't understand this, didn't make any, you know, okay, yeah, sure, I can say these words. And, uh, and it sounded very technical and involved. So, I have to, just to interject, uh, so you have to understand, she didn't know what this was for, even though I had been doing computer games for six years at that point. <laughs> this why, is how much like, wise you know, Why should I care? <laughs> <laughs> just bring home the money, that's all I care about. That's all. So they hired, go ahead. Yeah, so, so they hired me and I, and I went into the studio and all of this stuff sounded very technical. And I really, even during all of the recording, and of course Mark Laidlaw is the writer for the Half-Life games. Is it? You keep looking at me. And he, would, and he was, you know, always in the studio, you know, across the glass. And he would direct me about how, you know, how these lines should sound. But uh, I did my best work that I could, thinking I have no idea what I'm doing. Right, and it came out, and so now when I get to play Half Life Two, which I do a lot, I'm always glad to see me. <laughs> and my wife is always trying to get me arrested. So, <laughs> so young men, that's what marriage is about. <laughs> but, but at this point, I mean, you have to understand that voice actors always go into the studio by themselves. I mean, you know, studio time is expensive, we're expensive, they don't want us sitting around while somebody else is working. And a lot of time when you go in, you really have no idea what you're going to be doing. Right. Because we audition for all of these different parts, but you know, you do an audition and then pretty much you forget about it. You're just getting ready to do the next audition. So, you know, John and I uh, both do voices for Defense of the Ancients too. John does seven voices in the game. And I do Brood Mother and Death Prophet. But of course, I auditioned for several of the roles, didn't know which ones I had gotten until I went into the studio. And then they sort of played my audition for me. And my Death Prophet, Death Prophet, she's sort of Middle European. But they said, as I was recording Death Prophet, they said, well, you know, there's another voice in the game that sort of has that same accent. Can you do something else? Can you do French? And so I had to completely sort of rethink about it. And so the accent of Death Prophet moves from like Romania, you know, slowly, slowly across the continent to France. <laughs> so we call Death Prophet Euro Trash. <laughs> But, uh, but so, but it, they hired us both for Half-Life 2, and we did all the work for Half-Life 2, and it came out, and it was a big success. And uh, then I got an audition for several roles in a game called Team Fortress 2. And they said right off the bat that they were thinking about me for the sniper in particular, but they wanted me to read for several things, which I did. I forget who all I read for, but... Uh, but you know they gave you know once again they gave me lines and they gave me a, a drawing of the of the of the character and uh, and they were saying that they were thinking maybe that the sniper was an Aussie and so I gave them my best Aussie and I got that job and then they sent out an audition for the announcer or some victory. <laughs> One of the times, John, uh, I had gone in to do, you know, like an hour of the announcer, and John was scheduled right after me. And so I said to the guys, as I was, you know, to Bill Van Buren and Mark Laidlaw, I said, oh, you're gonna work with my husband next. And, and they said, well, who is that? And I said, well, John Patrick Lowry. And, and so we had done all this work for them. It was a total Warner Brothers movie. <laughs> they had no idea that we were married. So, uh, you know, late, later on they... Well, and then they sent out an audition. I mean, then, you know, Team Fortress 2 was put together, and then they sent out an audition 
for an odd little... An odd little thing. And with the audition, they wanted a female voice, and they sent a sound file. And they sent a sound file of a computer-generated voice, which they had used to develop the game. And they assumed that they would use this computer-generated voice until Val found out that it was copyrighted. And so for every game they sold, they'd have to give money to the copyright holder. But they realized, oh, we can hire an actor for a lot cheaper. <laughs> so they sent off the audition with a little clip of this sound file, and I guess I got the closest to, you know, the voice of a soulless... Uh, homicidal, manipulative, passive-aggressive computer. Yeah. <laughs> so, this long story is to show you that fame isn't guaranteed. It depends on a lot of domestic abuse <laughs> and then being cheaper than a sound file. <laughs> So, so, but at this point, they finally understood that we were married to each other. So the next game, we left. didn't even get the audition. They just no, said, no, no, they just called us in Left for Dead. Left for Dead, at the end of Left for Dead. Right, right. So you're going through, the, going through the city, and you're killing zombies, and you're trying to make it to the river. You make it to the river, and you hear this voice over the radio. On, on the houseboat. Well, we're on the houseboat. They are still on the, in the city. I've never played the game. Right. <laughs> on the houseboat on the houseboat radio is me with Ellen in the background. We're the bickering married couple at the end of the day. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, you know, things were going in, but I'll tell you, when, when Ellen started doing Portal and I started, you know, she started showing me some of the lines and this is hilarious stuff. <laughs> But when they sent us the email of Jonathan Colton's song, Still Alive, I thought, this game is going to go ballistic. This is. Well, and of course, what, what they sent me, uh, Bill Van Buren, the producer for the Portal games and, and many Valve games, sent a sound file of Jonathan singing the song. Well, as a trained musician, I don't really enjoy learning music that I'm going to perform from a, by, ear. A, by ear. So John notated the whole song for me, wrote it down. Because you know, of course we both started out as musicians. I started. I studied composition. Our our degrees are in music. Right. And so so John. Hey, music. One person likes music. That's right. <laughs> So when I went in to record the song, I actually had the sheet music in front of me and was able to give a copy of the sheet music to Jonathan Colton. <laughs> he was appreciative. And he was very appreciative. And he's, you know, he's a wonderful artist. And but it was it was very interesting because you know we had all the measure numbers and we could go back to this measure and I could question him about you know do you actually want this rhythm. Or do you want me to do a dotted rhythm here? And so it made it much easier that you know we actually had the the notation of the song written down that that Mr. Lowry did. Right, right. And but then, you know, with this with this whole well, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Well, all I was going to say is you know as as we just said, all our degrees are in music. When John and I were in school studying. We had no idea what we would be doing later because, of course, computer games didn't exist. Right. In fact, when we were in school studying, um, the only method of graphic communication was called cuneiform. You <laughs> <laughs> took this triangular stick and put it in your clay tablet. No, but actually, all, John is a composer, and he would take pen and ink to do all the music notation. 
Right. It wasn't until after both of us were long out of school. When I was writing music, I had to walk 30 miles through the snow. You know, there were the, the, the music programs Finale and Sibelius and all these things that we all take for granted now, which of course John used to notate the still alive. But John, pen and ink, pen and ink. And so, so he might as well have been a monk. So, so <laughs> many of you guys are in school now. So what we're saying is when we were in school, what we do for a living now didn't exist. And the same will be eye. for you. The right. same will be for you. Because right. the world and technology is just changing things faster and faster and faster. So, you may be in school now, or recently out of school, but you continue to learn your whole life. And, and that's also what you want to do. You want to continually being, learn to do new things. John and I have had to. Mm -hmm. and, and you should have to as well. That's right. And like it. <laughs> Woo! Well, that's kind of our story in a nutshell. I just wanted to give you guys a chance to ask us questions and stuff like that if you wanted to. Does anybody have anything that they would like to know about working for Val, working for Terry, Sky? Mm -hmm. Well, I have a question. Um, I'm not sure. Did you voice Kate Johnson in the Portal series? No, I did not, but thank you for, uh, I'll tell, uh, uh, J.K. Simmons. Right, J.K. You know, J.K. Simmons just won an Oscar for the movie Wipeout, Whiplash. and he plays a music teacher. Whiplash, thank you. Wipeout? I think that was something else. <laughs> you, can, you can play Wipeout, remember that? But anyway, J.K. Simmons, uh, no one should teach music like that, quite frankly. If you've ever, man, if you've seen that movie, no one should teach music like that. I teach music. I teach a lot of high school and middle school kids how to sing. And if I taught like that, I know I would be fired. But, but you know, I might win, a, win an Oscar. So that would be okay. Yeah, but thanks for asking. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir, up there. Uh, when you were um, doing valve work, like for uh, Portal and uh, Team Fortress 2, I realized that the Valve company has like a big, 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 big snack bar, which is full of Twinkies, Hostess, like pizzas and all that. Did you ever have a favorite snack that you wanted to see added into there? Well, the, you know, when Valve... Levels, really. Well, Valve has grown and grown and grown. And actually, when uh, Portal 2 was released, we went over to Valve for the big, you know, release party. They were only on one floor at that point. How many floors are they on? In this seven. Yes, yeah, seven. They have a huge cafeteria. They have over 400 employees. But, so the but company there's two levels has to grown answer that question. and grown and grown. The first level is we don't record at Valve. We record at a professional recording studio. Even Valve. though Valve has recording studios and a mocap studio. Right. Um, the second part of that question is when we go into the studio, all the writers and the director are in the control room. And in the control room, there are all kinds of really nice snacks. And we go into the booth. And they ask us if we want some water. <laughs> so that's the answer. Well, because you know you don't you don't want to be eating while you're recording. You don't. <laughs> I think Pudge should always be eating while he's recording. Fresh baked up now, now. So there's 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 the answer to that. But uh, the uh, no no snacks no snacks for the for the voice actors. We're just the higher. No, but the, the gentleman further back in the vest. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh yeah, that's me. Oh well, Jonathan Colton wrote "Want You Gone." He wrote it, but you know he was in the studio when I recorded it. Um, the recording session was four hours long. The first two hours was to record "Want You Gone," and the second two hours was to record the Turret Opera by Mike Moraski, because Mike Moraski wrote the whole score for Portal Two and he wrote the turret opera. And of course, all the voices in the turret opera are me as well, and Mike just moved them throughout the scale. So I'm singing the bass line, and the tenor line, and the alto line, and the soprano line, and, you know, the... How is the lyric to that opera 
complicated. Uh oh, you're sign languaging somebody. Is that somebody getting built? I'm, I'm asking you a question. How was how was the lyric to that opera, the little rhetoric of that opera created? So uh, I was in the studio, and you know Mike wanted me to do the song on every vowel, so ah, e, o, u, a, and then he said, well, can you make up some lyrics? And I said, well, sure. You want some Italian? And he said, yeah, yeah, make up something in Italian. So I made up something in Italian. And that's the libretto to the third opera. That's so I wrote, I wrote the words to Cara Mia Addio. So now, no, 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 I, I've, I've had my eye up there in that corner in front of that big spotlight. spotlight. Yes. Um, as musicians, was it ever odd for you to do voices that were monotone or didn't have a lot of you know, range or anything? Well, no, but it's very easy, really. Uh, because, for example, the the, the game, the, the first voice in Portal, before Gladys loses the morality core and her voice changes, that first voice is so pitch specific that I could get right on the pitch and just do the very few variations. So it was a it was a wonderful uh, test of my ear. Because literally, the first games of Portal, they would play each line for me in the computer-generated voice, and I would just copy it. And then later in the game, when GLaDOS starts going a little bit crazy, or really crazy, and you know talks about the cake recipe, etc., <laughs> the, the lines that they didn't, that they hadn't generated into the computer-generated voice, I was so used to doing that computer sound that, you know, I could just do it. And, and there were certain words, uh, welcome to the enrichment center, aperture science, and there was this little, in that computer generated voice, in the word aperture, there would be this little bump, aperture science, and I would do that every time. And there were certain words that GLaDOS said frequently, and I just had it stuck in my head about how this little computer-generated voice did it in this you know, little odd way. So it was, it was great fun. I loved doing the first voice. Uh, yes, you then. The, 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 uh, right. I was just wondering like, how many takes it takes you guys to do some of the the voices or whatever when you're acting. Well, the, the typical thing for a voice actor is you say, well, here, you know, you have a whole list of lines and uh, you give three passes on each line. And what you do is you go down the whole page, this is what I usually do, I give three passes on each line and then the producer and the writers mark lines that they need something else or they want me to do again. But that's really sort of the fastest way to work. And particularly for a character that I've done before, you know, if it's, a, if it's GLaDOS, they totally trust me to do it, and they let me do it that way, and then they'll say, oh, you know, Ellen, fourth line down on the page, we need her to sound a little more upset, or something like that. And then I go back and I record it, and so ultimately, you record the line until the client is happy with it. Right. But, you know, three times through is pretty typical, except, you know, sometimes the GLaDOS lines were so long, and since I was playing a computer, I didn't want to interrupt the line with a breath. So I would really sort of practice, okay, I'm gonna get this whole line out without a breath. And then a lot of the breathing that I did do, they edited out. You don't, you don't hear Gladys breathe. She doesn't breathe. <laughs> but, but, but in something like uh, Half-Life 2, or a lot of the other kind of war-based games that I've done, um, you'll, you'll read some lines and say, yeah, okay, now, ah, the guy you're yelling at is farther away. You know, so, so you know, really project your voice out there. Or no, here you're hiding in a, in a room, so you know, it's very soft. Uh, and so sometimes you, know, you just have to, you'll, you'll try it, and they'll say, yeah, that's, we, we need something different. And so that's just a conversation that goes on between you and the director. Does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. And there was someone further back in this same section who had a question. Yes, yes, you, sir. Um, in all your valve work, what has been your 
favorite lines to say? Well, my favorite line is, killing you and giving you good advice aren't mutually exclusive. <laughs> Joined Union of the Screen Actors Guild and American Federation of Television and Radio Artists. So we're paid union scale to work, but in voiceover, the contract is such that you're only paid for studio time. You are only paid for your time in the studio. Now, when I recorded the voice of Gypsy Danger for Guillermo del Toro's film Pacific Rim, that is a film. So for that, I do get residuals. I get residuals for my work in Pacific Rim. And I actually get some residuals for my singing on the Portal Games, just because that's a slightly different thing that I had to do. So I get, I get residuals for Still Alive, which is very nice. Well, right, those are royalties through Sound Exchange, which is if, they, if it gets airtime and performance time. Then. But uh, uh, the union keeps trying to get residuals into the, into the gaming contract, but a lot of gaming is non-union, and uh, so it's just a real tough sell at this point. So, no, so now we have to go to fan cons and talk to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. well, that's a very good question that we think about. Right, right. <laughs> yes. Would you like purposely stay in the booth even longer to see you get more money? Oh, now that's pretty good. There you go. <laughs> yeah, that's really how you get hired again. <laughs> you know, you know. Actually, there's sort of a fine line, and I have to say, all the work that I've done for Val, they, they are such artists, and they really understand the creative process. And when I was doing uh, the recordings for Portal 2, I recorded over a 10-month period for that game because the other developers and artists didn't want to work with anyone else's voice but mine. And when I first started going in, they would have me have like 40 pages of dialogue that they wanted me to do in an hour. And it became very clear to me quickly, and then to the writers, Eric Wolpaw and Jay Pinkerton, that this was really sort of superhuman to ask me to do this. So ultimately what they decided is, I went in about every two weeks for them and had a four hour session which was much more satisfying to me artistically because I didn't feel rushed and also worked better for them uh, because they could sort of gather their thoughts, get you know four hours of copy out of me 
they could go back, see actually what was going to be used in the game, and then do the rewrites and come back the next two weeks and have me record the things that they rewrote. Because while we were working on Portal 2, the story changed. They, they changed the, the way the story ran and the gameplay, etc. So uh, Valve has always given me plenty of time to feel like I did my best work. So they, I never felt rushed in the studio. And if it took another session, they paid me for another session. Of course, the other side of that is uh, when I'm doing things like uh, The Suffering, and The Suffering 2, I was 13 characters in The Suffering. And by the time you're to character number 13, and you're trying to come up with a dialect, and a pitch, and a melody, and a rhythm to the voice to make it different from all the other 12 characters you've just done, you're everyone's fried. And then you do that, and then of course, then it's time for everyone to die. <laughs> because dying is very hard on the voice, and so you're doing all of these different characters, and then you have to do the death screams of all these different dialects. And so you tell me how you differentiate between screaming with a southern accent and screaming with a buffalo accent. I mean, it, it, it can be very challenging, but you do all that screaming, and then you don't want to stay in the studio anymore. You just want to go someplace and fall over, so. Yes, um, yes, you, huh? Well, as, as we said, we started out as musicians. I, from a very young age, all I ever wanted to do was sing. All I ever wanted to do was sing. Nothing else. I, I'm even lucky that I got through high school. I'm lucky that she bathes, really. <laughs> That's right, he is lucky. I, I never wanted to do anything else. And then going to a conservatory and work on my graduate degree, it was all singing. It was all opera. I got bitten by the opera bug. And I moved to New York in 1979, and I was starting to do auditions, and I could sing rings around everybody. But I wasn't a very good actor. I didn't know what the job was. I didn't know what it took. So I realized, huh, I better get, get in an acting class. So I got in an acting class, and I took dance classes like three times a week, and I realized to be a stage performer, you really need to be able to do as many things as possible. And, uh, you know, so I started working in music theater, uh, besides just opera. So I was doing music theater and auditioning for opera, and then I met this guy in Europe, and then we got hired at WFIU in Bloomington, Indiana, the NPR station, and I was a DJ. Literally, John and I were both spinning discs. You were literally putting the LP on the record player and putting the needle down. It's encouraging the little dinosaur to run on the treadmill. To make it <laughs> right. So it, it was really a very slow evolution that we got into voice acting. I mean, I have to say first that I went from music into acting, and then ultimately this voice acting thing happened. And I was, uh, I mean, for one thing, my voice never changed. Uh, when I was born in uh, Honolulu, Hawaii, the nurses at Triple Army Hospital called me the B-29 because I cried two octaves lower than all the other babies. <laughs> uh, when I was in first grade, no joke, they made me the narrator of the Christmas play because, and I quote, he sounds like Walter Cronkite. <laughs> so I just wish they had video back then so I could see this little you know, two foot tall guy who sounded like me. But, uh, so there was that, and uh, you know, when I got into high school, I was in radio club, and uh, you know, I was in thespians and all that kind of, I did plays. Um, but everybody said, oh, you should become a radio DJ because you know, ladies everywhere would love your voice. And, well, but when I first met him, when we met in Europe on this show, he's in the orchestra, I'm on stage, I hear this voice and I say, oh my God, you should do voiceover. So, you know, people were constantly pressuring me, do voiceover, you're not good enough, you're not good enough. No, no, it was not all that. Um, but, but anyway, so I was doing this European tour show, and I was playing in the orchestra, and I met Ellen, and she was making like three times what I was making. <laughs> and I spent it all on him. That's right. Aww. Aww. It, was, it really was true, but anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but, but so, 
uh, there's a guy playing Captain Andy, this older role, and I was about 32 at that point. Most of the kids in the chorus were in their early 20s, and the guy playing Captain Andy went back to New York. Well, they had a guy in the cast who had been understudying Captain Andy, who then took over Captain Andy, but they then didn't have an understudy. And so I started bugging the producers to let me audition for the understudy, because I wanted more money. And um, I just bugged him and bugged him and bugged him and said, hey, listen, Captain Andy doesn't sing. He just tells jokes. It's like, you know, I could play banjo backstage and then come out and, you know, play Captain Andy and then go back and play banjo again, which was totally bogus. I could never have done that. But I just kept talking to him like that. And finally, they let me audition and they gave me the job. Well, so we close in Graz, Austria and have a week off, which I spent working my way down the boot of Italy because our next gig was in Palermo, Sicily. We got to Palermo, Sicily, and the conductor comes up to me and says, hey, John, have you ever played traps? And I said, well, yeah, yeah, I played traps, you know, per percussion. I said, great, because our drummer just went home. Never, didn't tell anybody, just took his equipment and went home. So we're wandering around the basement of this 18th century opera house looking for a hi-hat and a kick bass and, and, you know, and, and ride cymbals and all this kind of stuff. We found all that stuff. We found, so I had the, the, the trap set in front of me, the orchestra bells beside me, the chimes over here, my banjo here, my guitar here, and I'm going, strum, strum, I'm just playing everything. And then, the new guy playing Frank got sick. Now you have to know that the guy now playing Captain Andy used to play Frank. So the new guy playing Frank got sick, and his understudy decided to grandstand and say, I'm not going on unless you guarantee me two performances a week. So he, had, he thought he had him over a barrel. Well, they told him to go fly a kite, and they came and got me and said, okay, we're gonna have our new Captain Andy go back to playing Frank, we're gonna have you go on stage as Captain Andy, and we're gonna have the second violist take over as the percussionist. And so, <laughs> my first paid acting gig was telling jokes to a bunch of Sicilians who didn't speak English. <laughs> so, so that's how I got started in acting. And, uh, and then, you know, uh, once again, like, like Ellen, I was a DJ and we started doing commercials. And when we got out to Seattle, we just needed to make money. So that's something that I did to do that. Yeah, and when we first got to Seattle, our first gig in Seattle was, was with KUOW, which is also an NPR affiliate at the University of Washington. And that was uh, our first job out in Seattle. Right, right. Uh, yes. Because they're eating her? <laughs> well, I think it was the potato incident <laughs> that, that made GLaDOS wary of them. And then, you know, once you have a traumatic experience like that, it continues to affect you. But if you recall, she likes the little birds and their little talents if you recall that part. So, you know. And now, oh yes, the beautiful hair. You know who you are. Do you guys ever fall, like, out of the your voice layers at home? Like, it's all of them squishing your voice and argue like that? <laughs> if we could do that, I mean, can you imagine being in a fight with somebody? And, I mean, what, what do you do for a living? <laughs> what, what did you say? Take a Starbucks. Oh, I see. So, so if you were in a fight with somebody, would you would you suddenly stop and make a cup of coffee? I mean, being in a fight and all of a sudden start working. I don't know how that would work. No, no. Usually, when I get in a fight with him, I just go back to my Tennessee roots. Right. And I just cower. That's <laughs> Yes, sir. Yes, I was. I did. I did two Broadway shows. I guess that kind of eliminates my next question. I was going to say, are you still doing that? Well, I'm. I'm still doing music theater. I just finished uh, in February. Uh, I finished a four-month run of a production of Mary Poppins. So, My, my voice student, Cayman Illica, the fabulous Cayman Illica, was Mary Poppins. I was very, very proud. 
I had a little tiny character part called Miss Lark, and my acting partner was a puppet. Was and I was a little dog puppet, and I did the voice of the dog, and I understudied all the other character women in the show. So I was doing this little part, and I learned three other roles in the show, and I got to listen to my voice students sing Mary Poppins every single night. It was very gratifying. But, but we live out in Seattle now, so now Seattle does have a very active theater scene and very active yeah, in so, developing. So we're show. doing theater in Seattle all the time, but, but and, we left New York in 87. Right. I mean, there's always a chance we'd go back to Broadway with a show that's developed in Seattle. Well, jo John's actually been to New York just this year right. to do a reading of a new musical, and he done that before. Right, so so that could happen, but but it's if you're not in New York, it's hard to, to get work on Broadway. It's hard to get work on Broadway if you are in New York, so, yeah. So, yes, right down here. Hmm. So, um, if you want to get into, well, okay, I mean, voice acting musicians are wildly different. They're only the same in that, you know, you're going to be unemployed most of the time. <laughs> Uh, I think, you know, I mean, music, you know, put it out there, uh, you know, try to get gigs in, in local, I mean, my band, we started out in the local coffee shop, and we ended up opening for people like Buddy Rich and Pat Jones, um, so, you know, it's just, it's just putting it out there, putting it out there, putting it out there. For voice work, um, there are a couple different ways to go. Um, if you are in any kind of a metropolitan center where there's a lot of voice work going on, then I would definitely suggest that if you, if you don't feel you have the chops, if you're afraid that you don't have the chops, what I would do is Google all of the talent agencies in your metropolitan area and email them and say, hi, I'm interested in getting into voice work. Um, I want to put together a voice demo. Who would you recommend I go to? Um, because most of the talent agencies are like, okay, well, our, our people went to here, but we know these people are good, and so, you know, just so you don't get ripped off, so you know that you're going to somebody that knows what they're doing. Um, if, you know, if you need lessons in voice acting, take them. But I, but I think, you know, a step before that is, well, yeah, study acting. Right. right. Because, of course, John and I started out as, well, not started out, but... We did lots of theater acting before we Lots acting. of theater acting. And most of the people on the Valve games are friends of ours in the Seattle stage theater community. Right. So, so, so that can help, but that, I mean, that's one way to go. But, uh, but definitely then get a voice demo and then shop for an agent. Uh, I mean, that's the best way because agents basically are clearing houses. Um, people like Valve go to agents because they know that the agents know who, which actors are right for the, for the roles that they're looking and for. And there are some voice audition websites. Right, the other way to go, there's, there's sites online where you can like pay a yearly fee, 50 bucks or something like that. Things like Voice One, Two, Three, and you can Google those too. Just Google uh, voice acting audition sites, and a whole bunch of them will come up. Um, now, the, the caveat there is that all of these auditions are going out online, so they're going all over the world. So any audition that you see that's more than an hour old, don't bother, because they've already gotten probably a thousand auditions, two thousand auditions, and they're probably going to listen to the first five hundred at most. Um, so just know that if you're going to do that. Fresh, fresh auditions only. Don't waste your time with anything that's been up there for any time at all, really. But also, if you're if you're in a community of people who are into game development, even even on the you know the very basic level, starting out, volunteer. Yeah. Say, hey, why don't you let me voice voice a character? Because we we've met uh, quite a few people at the various cons who started out just getting together with friends, they put together a little game, they got it online, it was fairly successful, and they you know, started up a company and stuff like that, so that's another way to go. Um, and my students in Seattle, you know, I have all their email, and if I hear about an audition, then I send uh, my young friends, my young colleagues, the audition, so. Right. Um, because we, we don't do non-union work. But then somebody like John St. John, he was a DJ in LA, and he was hanging around the studio one time, and they said, oh, you'd be perfect for this guy, Duke Nukem. 
and then just come around. And so, and so it can happen that way too. You know, so I mean, you can like get a job in a recording studio and show everybody your talent, even though you work in pretty waste baskets, and hope that they'll just pick you for the job. But, so you know, there are lots of different ways to go. But I mean, the most you know basic way to do it is to put, put a voice demo together, learn how to act, put a voice demo together, get an agent, and start auditioning. Because you know, people think that we're voice actors and we just got a job as a voice actor 20 years ago and that's what we've done. We have to audition for every single part that we play, um, even at Val. I mean, the only, the, the only things that we didn't audition for were you for Gladys in, in Portal 2 and for us. And for us in uh, the the bickering the, the bickering married couple and left for dead, but even for Dota, even that they'd worked with us lots of times before, and they knew they were probably going to use us, they still sent us stuff to audition for, and they picked us for the characters that they wanted. So it's all about auditioning. There was a famous Broadway actor who said, "I audition for a living. Every once in a while, I take a vacation and work." <laughs> so, that's it. Yeah. Okay. So what we would like to do now is an archaic art form, an archaic communal art form called a sing-along. <laughs> oh, and, and you all have to sing. Oh, yeah. Because she doesn't remember the lyrics. <laughs> yes, that's true, because I've never had to sing them from memory. So, you may recognize these songs, we need you to sing along, need you to sing along. And we have the lovely John Patrick Lowry. Yeah. We have the lovely John Patrick Lowry on the banjo. Uh, John, can I tell, do you, do you know the, uh, what, the definition of a gentleman? Do you all know the definition of a gentleman? No, it's someone who knows how to play the banjo, but chooses not to. <laughs> <laughs> you know the definition of an optimist? A banjo player with a pager. <laughs> <laughs> I introduce Aaron Kennedy. So Aaron, how old were you when you first sang this song? Uh, when, the game, right, when the game first came out, that was like, that was a three, four years ago. 2011. 2011. 2011. <laughs> In 2011, well, one now, the game came out. Probably like, I can't say about 1617. 1617. Blossoming, blossoming <laughs> in the world. Okay, so, Aaron, be friendly with the crowd. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Oh, and by the way, I am performing in the Murder Mystery Show in about uh, an hour now. So come and see us. Also, shameless plug. Yay. <laughs> That's exactly what you're supposed to do. How many, how many of you guys have seen Fantasia? It's been a while. You know this, the Igor Stravinsky piece, Ride of Spring, with all the dinosaurs? Yeah. Yeah. This is what I like to do to classical musicians.
I'd be so sincere right now Even though you broke my heart and killed me And tore me to pieces And threw every piece into a fire As they burned it hurt Because I was so happy for you that panel but I also want to let you know that we will be tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. not too terribly early sort of fashionably early 11 a.m. we'll be in the Kiva in Baldy and John's going to be doing a panel on writing and I'll be there too we always do everything together we do yes so tomorrow so TF2 panel we're going then tomorrow morning, Kiva and Baldy at 11 a.m. And after we go crash TF2, we'll be back at our table in the lobby and we have Dancing with Eternity, the science fiction extravaganza by none other than John Patrick Lowry. And we can tell you all about the novel. And we can tell you all about the audio book. And you can buy either one. <laughs> We are so happy to be here at UBCon. You all are fabulous and a wonderful audience. Thank you. Exit out the front entrance and then go back up the stairs to get back in line. That's for Chris.